Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Jaime Martinez. I'm the Senior Project Manager with the UTSA Small Business Development Center COVID Business Recovery Accelerator. Uh, welcome to everybody for our first, our inaugural uh, COVID Business Town Hall. Uh, this is our first of, uh, of the uh, regular town halls that we'll be, uh, we'll be setting up and uh, presenting to you all uh, every two weeks. So we will be holding all of them uh, uh, on Tuesdays uh, as we move forward. So again, welcome to everybody. Uh, we're happy that today's topic, we are, uh, we are announcing that it's uh, for preparing, the pay preparing for the Paycheck Protection Program loan forgiveness process. Uh, it is a very hot topic, especially for those, uh, for you businesses that were, uh, were able to uh, acquire the PPP uh, loan funding during the, the first round in the first couple of weeks of, uh, of April. Uh, so just to kind of start off, there is our contact information below. Uh, we do have a, a great deal of, of information on our website um, and our email address, our phone number. I, we will provide our guest speakers uh, contact information here shortly as well. Uh, and so today we'll be providing the relevant information so that you all can prepare for the loan, the long-awaited loan forgiveness uh, application process. So uh, just to, to start out, a little disclaimer, uh, our, our guest, uh, Rebecca Schultz, uh, myself, Jaime Martinez, is one of the business advisors, uh, Deidre Patillo, who will be helping us moderate the Q&A, uh, Mr. Rex Steele from our Texas State University Small Business Development Center. Uh, we are not attorneys. We are not certified public accountants. Uh, you know, we, we are not licensed in the state of Texas for any of that stuff. What we are providing you today are the best practices. Uh, uh, information that we have learned from uh, our CPA friends and our, our our banker friends, our financial institution contacts, uh, and uh, and also our any attorneys that we have access to for best practices to provide you the most relevant and up to date information that we've obtained from the Small Business Administration and the Treasury Department. So just wanted to let you know about that in the very beginning. So just some quick housekeeping, you know, uh, we've already muted everybody's uh, phone lines, uh, your microphones on your computers, uh, as well as your, your, your cameras. Uh, if you do find yourself that you, you're live, uh, please make sure that you need it. We wanna make sure that uh, all the attendees hear everything that we have to say. Uh, we will answer questions throughout the presentation when, when appropriate, but we will have an open Q&A discussion there at the very end. Uh, please submit all your questions to the chat box, please. Uh, also, very, very, very important to us that at the very end, uh, we will be submitting a survey to you all because we are a Small Business Administration funded program. Uh, it is uh, very important to us uh, for the continuous funding that uh, you know, is required, required of us, but also it helps us provide a, a better event, a better presentation to more relevant information for the future. Our, as I mentioned, uh, we will be doing these COVID business town halls with relevant information to you, the, uh, the, the micro, the small, the medium sized businesses, uh, relevant topics to all of you that have been affected by, by COVID-19. Uh, our next one is June 9th, and we'll be sending out that information to you all in the near future. Uh, so just a little bit of information about us, as I mentioned, uh, we are funded by, by the Small Business Administration. So this presentation, the, sorry, this uh, town hall has been brought to you by the CARES Act. So we started up this program as a result of CARES Act funding. So why do we do what we do? So our vision for this program is to help you all, the attendees, uh, you know, provide you with relief, understanding the, uh, the debt relief that is available to you through the SBA disaster loan programs. You know, how getting your, your, your business rebooted after you, you found that relief, that funding, you know, recover hopefully after all this is over and then being resilient uh, in the future with our continued uh, business advice through the Small Business De uh, Development Center. Um, let's see here. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do want you to visit our website. Uh, at the, uh, the COVID Business Recover, Recovery Accelerator website so that you can obtain information on uh, not just on funding, uh, 
uh, but employer services, how to bring the, your employees back, Texas Workforce Commission information, uh, taxes and things like that, how they affected you during this particular COVID pandemic. Cybersecurity, there are a lot of issues that are going on right now uh, due to the fact and, and, uh, and those uh, bad players taking advantage of these small businesses through the internet. Uh, safety, how to bring your employees back and those employees you have with you, how to help them with, uh, you know, with the, uh, keep them safe in the workplace. And then continuous training as we're doing right now and again, our contact information. So I'm going through this a little bit fast, but I want to make sure that we uh, we give plenty of time to our guest speaker today. So we are, if you are visiting us uh, in other parts around the state, uh, you know the great thing is that our network, the Southwest Texas Border Region Small Business Development Center network, is not just in San Antonio, Texas, where where myself and my colleagues are. We are around uh, the the the, uh, the Southwest Texas Border Region. So those are the different cities that we do cover. We have over 20 small business development centers throughout the state of Texas, and we are part of a larger nationwide networks. So we have over a thousand offices throughout the United States, providing you the type of information that we're providing you today. Okay, so very specific services that we're offering uh, as a result of the COVID pandemic and, and uh, funds that we were received by the CARES Act to be able to help our, our, uh, the rest of our colleagues in the Small Business Development Center, they're all already providing uh, this type of, of, of technical business assistance to their existing clientele to be able to handle the capacity of, of new businesses coming in uh, and uh, to be able to help them and, and uh, you know, provide additional capacity. These are the type of services that we're offering, providing you technical business assistance through all these uh, uh, needs that, that you all currently have. Okay, so let's get into the presentation. So today uh, I have uh, Rebecca Schultz. Rebecca is our invited uh, subject matter expert on the, uh, uh, on the Paycheck Protection Loan Program and the specific part of it uh, on, uh, on preparing for loan forgiveness. Uh, so Rebecca is not new to the Small Business Development Center Network, uh, particularly in Houston where she is a regular participant for our colleagues up there. Uh, on webinars related to all the economic injury disaster loans that SBA is offering, SBA is offering at this particular time. Uh, Rebecca, please tell us about yourself and what you do there at, uh, at Centerline. Yeah, so I've been in banking for over 25 years. I've dedicated at least 15 years of my life to small business lending. So outside of following this topic as a seasoned commercial loan officer, I've also been an entrepreneur in multiple ventures. And um, I've started Centerlock or founded it just really for the passion of helping business owners access capital. Um, timing was really perfect because I've been able to really follow this whole CARES Act, um, the IDLE loans, the Economic Injury Disaster Loans and the PPP loans from the very beginning on how that is impacting specifically our small businesses. So it's a critical topic and it's not one that I feel others really follow as wholeheartedly or as closely as I do or that we're able to at Centerlock. Good deal, thanks Rebecca. I mean, so again, thank you for participating in this event. So, you know, Re Rebecca, getting right into it, I mean, tell us about your experiences. What do you know right now uh, you know, that, that has happened. I mean, we talk about history, really all this just, you know, uh, started with the SBA's uh, disaster loan process, uh, you know, in, in March. Uh, and it wasn't that long ago, but there is some history behind it. So tell us about what you know, your experiences during the first and second rounds of the funding for the Paycheck Protection Program. Yeah, so with SBA, um, in any natural disaster situation, they rush to try to support those businesses and individuals impacted. And in this situation, we've seen not only with IDLE loans, but particularly these PPP loans, that 4.3 million businesses have taken over $500 billion in SBA funds which I just wanna pause there because that is just amazing, right? In a matter of a few short months, um, most of the small businesses have become 
uh, participants in this type of funding challenge. So just the sheer volume of what we're dealing with when we're talking about this PPP forgiveness, um, there's going to be huge amounts of individuals wrestling with this very topic on how to maximize the forgiveness because quite frankly, these businesses are in a weakened state or at least most of them are in a weakened state. And if we don't get this right, then we could potentially um, impact not only our economies for today or the near impact, but this is a long-term impact for our economies. So I really wanted to um, focus a lot of attention or energy around getting this topic right because the submission for forgiveness happens just after June 30th, going into July. And all of these millions of businesses are gonna go through the same exercise. Yeah. So a good deal. No, I mean, that's, that's you know, again, all of that has happened and in, in really just a, a bit over a couple of months now, you know, Rebecca. So, I mean, you know, now that, and that last point that you brought up, you know, uh, now that the first round, I mean, those businesses that applied in in, uh, in early April when the financial institutions, uh, you know, were, were, well, did their best that they could to, because there really, there was not much lead time to prepare for the volume of, of applications there at the very beginning, uh, you know, with some direction, but not a whole lot. Uh, you know, there are that those, in those first couple of weeks, there are a lot of companies, a lot of businesses that are coming up uh, for time to report on uh, on their loan forgiveness uh, for the PPP. Uh, you know, what can you recommend, Rebecca, to those attending here today for best practices? You know, for example, how to manage the funds, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, keeping the proper payroll documentation for payroll expenses and non-payroll expenses. You know, talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, so that is a really good topic. And I think it's one that a lot of business owners haven't really fully understood. And that's primarily because they, they've the world's on fire for them. They're rushing around trying to save the business as opposed to really understanding or putting a lot of energy on how to protect themselves in the long run. So what we do know is that SBA has over $25 million funded to them and it goes to the support of auditing these small businesses, okay? Um, we know going into both the PPP conversation as well as the Economic Injury Disaster Loan or IDA Loan conversation, that SBA temporarily suspended what we call the credit elsewhere component. And that's important because it really ties into this whole conversation of documentation you mentioned. Because typically to access SBA funds, we have to prove that individuals didn't have access to funds outside of SBA. There was no other options for them. SBA has always been known as a lender of last resort. And they waive that through the CARES Act, trying to allow immediate or speedy help to these businesses. But that doesn't, that doesn't like um, make us unable to go back at the time of you know, this forgiveness conversation and make sure that we're qualifying all of those individuals to receive the funding. And so that whole conversation about documentation really dives into whether or not they should have gotten access to the PPP funds or the idle funds. And then how do they document that they in fact were in need and didn't have any other resources outside of SBA. And so when we go into this forgiveness conversation, it's much more elaborate than just keeping track of your payroll records or maybe your um, utility bills, right? The breadth of support that's needed in order to back up even taking out access to the SBA loan funds is really huge. And it's a long-standing impact that business owners are gonna have to hold on to and justify for six years going into the future. And that $25 million that SBA received for funding to do the audits I think everybody should take this very seriously, that SBA is going to be looking for the proper documentation and that business owners are 100% responsible and liable for being able to show that they were in need and they took the funds out in a legitimate effort to support their business. Wow, I mean, so uh, they need to start preparing now. <laughs> they need to start yeah. Immediately. Now. Immediately, oh, good deal. 
Well, uh, let me kind of go to the next slide, which, you know, uh, next bit of information that I think will, uh, will continue to help as far as getting these, uh, these things right. Yeah, so um, really, I, I want a everybody to really understand that this isn't just about um, you know making sure that your application looks good or that all your your balance is balanced right this is a much bigger conversation that exceeds just our own individual business or our community this goes on to a nation a nationwide call because if we don't get this right then it, it is like a domino effect all right it's not only does our business suffer but our, our economy suffers, but our banking system suffers because what essentially has happened is that the banks and the treasury department have all put themselves at risk to support the small business owners. Now, rightly so, because the small business owners employ the largest section of our, our nation, our economy, right? It is a huge impact to helping us all survive. But at the same point, if we, don't treat this well, right? If we don't document what we've done, if we don't utilize these funds, what they're intended to be utilized for, everything pretty much gets thrown off, right? And this would be really devastating to our economy in general. So it's really important that we get this right. Like we have to get this right as small business owners. Good deal. Well, you know, Rebecca. So let's let's talk about you know the uh, you know what's kind of happened in the the past almost two weeks now that. Uh, that SBA released the uh, you know the uh, the loan forgiveness application. Talk to us about that. Yeah, I'm really excited about this because up to the point of the 15th of May, we knew that there was going to be a forgiveness component to this PPP loan, and it's really unnerving to take out money and know that there's strings attached, but not know what strings are essentially attached, right? And so when they released the application for the PPP forgiveness, we really got to see uh, what was going to go on and how this whole forgiveness conversation would be calculated. So we finally have the ability to calculate what would be forgiven or what would be unforgiven, and then what would be the penalties or the cost of the unforgiven component. Because um, business owners are really live on the ground making important decisions for their companies on you know, who to hire back, how much to pay those individuals, really what direction they're gonna take their organization in general. And the application gave us a lot of, for me, a lot of flexibility and relief in knowing that we had somewhat of a control over that final outcome, which would be the uh, forgiveness. More importantly, what I love to see was these safe harbors and the mindset behind what the utilization of the PP funds would allow for business owners to do. So that was really relieving in many respects. So, so, so uh, yeah, you know, yeah, please, uh, you know, clearly help us clearly define some of what you just mentioned. Yeah, so um, I think the application gave us really a whole new language, right? And it's really important that business owners understand the new language because the language really centers around how we think about certain aspects of our activities um, that are governed in connection to the application, right? So when I, when I say definitions and a new language, I mean, we really gotta get comfortable with what we're talking about. And these are new definitions for business owners. And they're really having to like uh, go back to the board and understand how their activities during these timeframes, uh, which are connected to these definitions, are, are um, handled, right? So some of the major ones that came out of the application included covered period which covered period starts typically the day that you get your PPP loan funds. So for a lot of our business owners, they've already received the funds. So they're already in the midst of what we would call their covered period. So all activities around those PPP funds, what they're using them for, uh, what has accrued, um, you know, just activities in general from the business really are focused around that definition. Now, through the application for the forgiveness, we also got to see a new term. Um, I love this term, actually. I think most of you on the presentation are gonna love this term too, and that's the alternative covered period. So 
in this covered period, only the activities that were accrued, that means we, um, we did them, like we hired employees back and we owe them money for their wages, right? That's an accrued expense. But they allowed this during this covered period to move that time frame from when we received the PPP funds to when we can actually utilize them for those payroll periods, kind of saving us from having to do a lot of calculations on accrued expenses. Um, and they came up with a new definition, right? And so this allows businesses that have payroll cycles that are typically bi-weekly, that's 14 days or more frequent, they can adjust their covered period specifically for that payroll component. Right. And again, it just moves it over a little bit within reason and allows for that whole payroll cycle and all those payroll periods to be within your covered period. Right. And then we have what we this conversation called reference period. And if you're like me, um, reference period, what you thought reference period, what you were measuring against uh, from your pre disaster time frame to your post disaster time frame was 2019 because in the application for the PPP funds, we had to figure out what we did in 2019, average that out into an average monthly payroll cost, and then multiply that over 2.5, right, roughly two months. Well, when they came out with this definition for reference period, they're giving a lot more flexibility to the small business owner. It's not all of 2019, right? The business owner has the opportunity to change what they're measuring against, Right. And uh, the most notable reference period is, of course, January 1st through March 31st, that you have that time frame in order to measure your employee count as well as your activity, like how much you paid those employees and wages. So um, just understanding the language is helpful. Right. So we talked a little bit about accrued expenses, right? If I hired back my employees and they started work, then obviously the pay that I owed them from that day ahead of the payroll cycle would be an accrued expense, right? That, that's an easy one. Then we have this whole new conversation of what we call the average full-time equivalency. And they um, gave it a little acronym. That acronym is going to be famous, I promise. It's the FTE. So the FTE allows for business owners to really understand how many full-time equivalent or full-time headcount that they had during the reference period. The post the um, the covered period, right, or alter alternative covered period when you're considering that. So we're really understanding these little sections of time and how we're utilizing those time periods with the headcount as well as the um, pay or wages in understanding our forgiveness conversation. And so there's really two ways that we lose the forgiveness, right? And the two ways would be if we don't hire back up to the same full-time equivalent headcount. Now, remember, I told you there's some flexibility in that. So business owners have uh, different ways to view that reference period. And so they can choose a reference period that really makes sense for their business, where they're gaining the most advantage, right? And they have to explain that. But if a business owner isn't really thinking about that, and this is the dangerous part of just now getting this forgiveness application, is a lot of businesses have already gotten close or very near that um, 56 day or eight week period. And they didn't have the benefit of understanding how these calculations were gonna go down. Right. They only entered the conversation knowing that they had eight weeks to spend this money up. And it was almost as if they spent it all within their approved categories, they would be fine. But that's not necessarily the conversation that we understand coming through the forgiveness application. Right. We have to hire back up to the same or near same full time equivalent. And then we've got to pay these people the same type of hourly wages or um, hours in order to gain benefit. For the full forgiveness. Um, Rebecca and Jaime, if I could ask one more question about the FTE. We have several folks who originally calculated their applications on the 30-hour FTE um, as the only federal guidance, of course, previously was the ACA. So can you speak to that briefly? Yeah, that is um, confusing and difficult, right? So just understand 
originally we did know that the business owner could really drive that conversation of what they considered full time for their business. And a lot of people did consider the 30 hour that has changed. And so now SBA is looking at the full time equivalency being equal to a 40 hour work week. And so it's not not horrible. All right. It just means there's a little bit more calculation. So just because we may have calculated on the PPP application going into the loan that we had so many full time headcount. It doesn't mean that that's what they're going to use when we go into the forgiveness conversation. They're allowing for us to adjust it for this 40 hour work week. And so we're going to go back to that reference period that we've uh, determined. And again, each business has their their option of what they're going to choose. And in the application, it gives you really three different definitions of reference period that you can choose from. So business owners have to figure that out, right? But we're going to go back and figure out what that headcount uh, that we're using was based on the 40 hour uh, a week per employee headcount as full employee. And then we're going to compare it against our post uh, disaster, right? That's going to be our covered period or alternative covered period conversation. And then we're going to line that up. Now, again, I don't want people to freak out because I know that that is really scary that this is all changed. And now I maybe have put something on the application that's going to harm me in the future. Just know that we are resetting the stage with the application for forgiveness. And as a business owner, you have different options of time frames that go from 2019 to 2020 to choose and you choose what makes the most sense for you and really gives you as a business owner the most advantage towards that forgiveness conversation. So there's there's options there. Yeah, and um, you know, I love this. So we got the slide up here talking about safe harbor and I think that's really an important conversation. So when we're talking about the FTE, right, the full-time equivalency safe harbor, SBA did come in and gave, three beautiful cases of how business owners can use or find safe harbor when calculating the forgiveness on the FTE component. So let's just walk through this because I think most businesses are seeing this live where they've got employees that are refusing to come back. Maybe those employees are making more on unemployment than what they were doing uh, in-house pre-disaster and there's a hesitancy to come back. All right, so uh, in fact, over the weekend, we saw this even broadened more in support of the small businesses. But we as small business owners have to just document that we offered those employees back their, their, um, their same hourly rate as well as their same pay uh, and hours to give them back the opportunity to work, right? So if they choose not to come back after receiving written notice, then uh, we can actually, we have an obligation as a business owner to report them to uh, the workforce uh, solution just to let them know that they were received the opportunity to come back and they decided not to come back. We have an obligation as business owners to do that within 30 days. That's a new one that came over the weekend, right? Um, we can also still fire employees for just cause. So if employees aren't, you know, behaving or coming in on time or doing what they're supposed to do, it doesn't mean that they uh, go corps blanche, right? We can document that we fired them for cause and we don't have to count their headcount into our calculations right as well as employees that resign you know this is a very f fertile job market and so employees maybe have found other positions the business owner uh, going into the FTE conversation for forgiveness is not going to be penalized if an employee leaves um, due to their own cause or reaction or re a resignation so there's a lot of wonderful things about that safe harbor that really protects the business owners FTE counts right so if you have any of those situations as long as you provide documentation and connection to your application, you'll find safe harbor and you won't see the same type of penalties you would if you didn't return those full-time equivalent headcounts back to work. Right. We also saw a safe harbor with the salary hourly wage, where if um, you, let's say, reduce some hours or reduce some payroll for those employees during the uh, disaster period, Right, you're given a clear safe harbor, or as long as you return those headcounts or those, excuse me, those employees back to their same wages and salary, right, then you will be able to gain benefit under that safe harbor. Just remember, if you're taking that salary or wage safe harbor, 
They really are intending for you to continue that for a period of time after June 30th. You can't necessarily claim that you increase their wages and you uh, take the safe harbor. And then later, let's say down the road, if you get audited, um, that lasted until the end of July. And then you, you, know, you went right back down to the pre-disaster or the disaster wages, and you really didn't give any benefit to that. There's going to be some accountability after that June deadline if you take that safe harbor. So just remember that. Yeah, good point. This is something that we've been receiving a lot of uh, questions on, Rebecca, as well as the documentation, you know, yeah. uh, best practices, but not necessarily best practices. This is what's required. Can you kind of go over some of that? Yeah, I'd love to. All right. So payroll is really fairly simple, even for sole proprietors and independent contractors. All right. When you're dealing with SBA in any source of verifying use of funds, then you need to be able to provide two folds of verification. All right, it's really important. It's going to always tie back to bank statements. So I do recommend if you receive those PPP funds, those go into an account that is really clean, meaning that if you had to, and you will, provide copies of those bank statements, there's not going to be any um, strange uses of those funds that you don't want the government to see. All right. So it's best if you go ahead and put those PPP funds in a separate account and that you are literally tracking everything that you take out of that account with a second form of verification. So let's just talk about payroll. So the second form of verification outside of the bank statements are going to be your payroll processing records. Right. So that's going to be um, if you use ADP or uh, paychecks or PaySphere or whatever that payroll processing company is, they're going to provide you with reports that are going to detail out, and this is really important, and we'll talk about this when we get to the application, but you really need to show who is an employee of your organization, the pre-disaster, that reference period we talked about, as well as during that covered period or that alternative covered period. All right, so you need to know who the employees were, how many hours they worked for that payroll period or that whole period, that uh, alternative covered period, as well as how much you paid them. So that all goes into it. So you're going to need that payroll processing records down to that level of detail. If you're a sole proprietor or independent contractor, I do recommend that you go ahead and at least have some record of like a check, uh, a front and back canceled check where you paid yourself those wages and you take advantage of that memo line and you make sure that it shows that it was payroll to yourself and that you're showing it going from one account into a personal account. Because again, SBA is really staunch about having that two forms of proof, okay? So let's, let's go into um, filing your, your taxes, all right? So pretty soon, we're gonna have to file our second quarter 2020 payroll taxes, that's your 941s. So if you typically file 941s for your employees, just remember, you're gonna have to show that level of documentation in connection to your um, alternative covered period or covered period, right? So you need to have that. And I would recommend that even if you haven't quite filed it, that and you're applying for the forgiveness with your PPP lender, that you have a copy of what you intend to file attached to your application. That's gonna be really important. They wanna see that 941s. They wanna see that you have reported that to the government and that's another verification that you've done what you needed to do, all right? Now for the non-payroll, again, it's gonna be bank statements. Everything hinges off those bank statements, but you're gonna also, for instance, on the mortgage interest, you're gonna to need to show a copy of your lender's amortization schedule showing what was interest and what was principal. And you need to show that what you're claiming for your forgiveness is just the interest portion. All right. Now it gets a little bit stickier when we go into the non-payroll expenses, because if you read the application for forgiveness, it states that they want for all of those non-payroll uh, records, they want them from the start of February, so that is pre-disaster, all the way through one month after your covered period ends, okay? Mm -hmm. So if I took out my, um, my PPP loan mid-April, right, and I'm going to use part of my uh, utility bills for my electricity for my forgiveness, I need to go back, and if I'm going to use that expense, I need to go back from February, that is even before I got my PPP funds, right? I need to go from February, cover February, March, April, May, June, July, 
right? And in my documentation in order to show that I've done what I needed in order to get eligibility for forgiveness on that item. So you can imagine like business owners that didn't understand what they were going to have to provide and don't provide the accurate information to the lender, they're going to be in a world of pain. Whereas businesses that are getting this information early in the conversation, maybe they are still uh, using their PPP funds because they're still in their covered period, they'll know what they need, that level of detail, so that when they get to the end of that covered period, they're in a much better uh, position with proper documentation to file for that forgiveness quickly. Now, I just let's just talk about that real quick, okay? So forgiveness needs to be filed for quickly. You can't file for forgiveness on July 1 in most cases, okay? Because the SBA is asking through this documentation verification that you do have one month post your covered period in support documents in order to place it with your application. So the only people that will be able to file as early as the first part of July are gonna be those that got their PPP funds in round one. All right, round one, they got them early because everybody else, when they've accessed those PPP funds and their covered period starts, they're going to have to go one month beyond that in order to have the support documentation required from those lenders. So just keep that in mind. And I honestly, I would keep up with those bank statements. I would keep up with a separate uh, spreadsheet on Excel for all the payroll purposes as well as non-payroll purposes. And I'd be putting together a file that had all this level of detail. So when it was time, I was able to um, file properly for that forgiveness. Thanks, Rebecca. I mean, wow. Okay, so uh, you know, that's a uh, you know, really, really good points uh, that you brought up in, in reference to you know, the best practices and, you know, preparing, you know, to get to the part before we even get into the application. So, you know, I mean, you know, now that you've explained, you know, uh, really the, uh, to the, to the audience on, uh, you know, the, the definitions, I mean, they, they're having to learn the specific language to better communicate with their lending institution and what SBA ultimately is requiring for, for forgiveness it's not going to happen right away, but it is something that they need to start thinking about now. If not, after we get off this, uh, after we get off this, uh, this town hall today, start filling out and downloading the application. Uh, you know, what can the borrower expect? You know, when they get into the loan forgiveness, and let's kind of get into the the meat of this, uh, you know, meat of the deal, the meat of this uh, this webinar today. Yeah. Okay. So what I wanted to share with you guys um, is, in fact, what the application looks like completed. All right. And before you even go into starting to complete the application, I'm going to make some recommendations. Okay. Just remember, I consider myself financially literate, right? I deal with SBA daily. I've dealt with them for over a decade. Um, and I was still thrown off by this application because it looks like you're only filling out a page, two pages, but it's much more complex than that. So to set you up for success here, I want you guys to have a copy of a calendar, maybe two calendars, all right? Because you're gonna be looking at the reference period, right? When things were um, calculated as far as your FTEs, you've got to look back in time and then you're gonna have another calculator or calendar, sorry, for that covered period. And those two are, are possibly gonna be utilized. You're gonna strategize over what looks best based on these numbers. Just understand, it's like a strategy here. So you need to make sure that you understand clearly what timeframes you're gonna be using and referencing in that application, because you're gonna to have to state that clearly and then all your calculations. Now remember, those are the accrued calculations are gonna be based off of these calendar days and you're gonna be having to look at your statements and maybe back through some of those accrued expenses in order to fully gain the benefit. All right, and that's a lot of work. All right, so calendars, maybe two even, right? Uh, definitely a calculator, because when you are going in and trying to figure out however many days were in your covered period, you're gonna be having to divide and uh, really make sure that you're adding these things properly, right? I'm gonna also make sure that you have a copy of your PPP loan contracts available. Now you're gonna need to see when you receive those PPP funds, uh, you're gonna need things like your lender's account number, your PPP SBA loan number, right? These are those details that you can only get from your actual applications and your contracts. 
So make sure that you've got that. Also, you're gonna need to hold on to that pre-disaster paperwork that you used in connection with your application for the PPP loan. Remember, that's part of that requirement for six years documentation you need to hold on to. So if you maybe didn't get a copy of your application of the PPP loan because you filed that electronically, get that now from your lender before that whole forgiveness storm comes and you're probably not gonna get uh, you know, you'll be lucky to get five minutes of the lender's attention at that point in time. So grab that now while you can. It's your responsibility to have that in the event of audit. You can't go back and get it from the lender. All right. So it's important to know that. All right. You're going to also need all your support information to do your calculations. So that's, you know, your payroll processing records from your covered period. Remember, they need to go into a specific detail on the names of the employees the last four digits of your social security numbers, the number of hours worked for each pay period that you're combining it is a lot of information. And I'm gonna tell you, not a lot of people have this level of information just readily available in one source, all right? They don't. So you might have to go through several different like systems, your payroll tracking system versus your accounting system, and you need to pull together that information. And all of that's gonna be needed for successfully completing your PPP forgiveness, right? And the number one thing is just patience. I think when I went through this and I had a fake company uh, that I'm gonna show you in a minute, it still took me uh, longer than what I anticipated and I just had to have patience that I could slowly read through and digest this information. Now, it's, it's all gonna be worth it, all right? So if you're like worried now, it's gonna be worth it because having the forgiveness of that loan is huge. I'm gonna show you based on my face example, some of the monetary gain, okay? So when looking at your information, once you've pulled it together, I personally recommend just dividing it up, right? So we've got those definitions that we talked about. We've got our um, reference period. Right. In this example, I used the just the basic reference period of January 1 through March 31st, and it came up with a list of my uh, employees during that time frame, how much I paid them on an hourly basis versus how many week or um, hourly and, and how much I paid them per hour versus how many hours they worked. And I came up with my FTE. Now, the FTE calculation, you're given a little bit of flexibility. You can take it based off of a 40 hour work week. So you would take however many hours they worked. In my scenario here, it was 40, right? For that top one. And I divide it by 40. So when I when I do that, I get one. So that's one FTE. Now you can take this down on that part-time employee level. You've got to figure out what makes more sense for you where you get um, a better FTE number or count that supports the full forgiveness. But you can say that part-time employees are worth half of an FTE, right? In this case, um, because I have these people working 10 hours a week, right? If I did half, then that would make it one and a half employees. If I do it this way, I'm actually getting less employees. Um, so I have less of a requirement to hire back up when I am trying to get my forgiveness. So again, you've got a little flexibility in these numbers, but just organize the data. So I organized my reference period data. I organized my post-disaster data, how many employees I dropped down to. In this scenario, you can see using that FTE calculation, I had only two employees during that pre-PPP funding period post-disaster. And then um, I did my alternative covered period. I moved it around to coincide with my payroll, right? I took advantage of that. And then I looked at what it would look like um, if I hired back up through the end of that covered period, which in this case was July 3rd. So when you're looking at the information, things like the FTE are important, things like your total wages spent and understanding how close you are from your pre-disaster reference period to your, your um, covered period was important. So let's see how you plug everything into your, your company. You have control. Yeah, all right, excellent. So real quick, I'm gonna just zoom in here. All right, make this really easy for all of us to read. So here we go. So this is essentially what the application looks like. I'm not gonna focus so much on it right now because before you actually complete the application, there are schedules and worksheets that you have to go through to understand what goes on this form. But I'm gonna give you just a real quick overview of what it looks like in general. 
So you can see I've inputted my name, very similar to the application uh, that you use going into the PPP. I'm going to put in the PPP SBA loan numbers, uh, the details from that transaction, how much I borrowed on that PPP loan, as well as whether or not I took out the IDLE grant, also known as the IDLE advance. Now that's critical because we learned after the fact that if I took out an IDLE grant, also known as an IDLE advance, again, that was a fully forgiven funding, then I would not see that same uh, relief come from the PPP loan, meaning that I have to subtract out that grant amount from the available forgiveness for my PPP loan. All right, so although you're not gonna have the calculations in here to subtract that out, just know that that is part of this conversation. All right, now next I'm going to identify those number of employees. Remember, we're resetting the stage. So maybe in the application, I put that I had six employees, right? I didn't realize it was going to be an FTE conversation. And certainly the definition of FTE was not out when we applied. I'm resetting the stage in the application here, redefining it based on the current understanding of the definition of employee headcount, okay? So um, it's just giving the basic information. We, we determine what type of covered period we're going to use. And then the numbers that are associated, that's gonna come after that schedule worksheet uh, and schedule, right? So let's, uh, real quick, let's go into the next page. All right, so when I talk about starting with the worksheet, this is where the math starts to happen. Even if you're in your, um, covered period, right? Even if you're in the midst of that 56 days, go ahead and start doing this now. And I'm going to show you what this looks like. Because um, if you're running the numbers and you're understanding where you are in that forgiveness conversation, you're going to have the biggest benefit. All right. So in this case, I have my employees named out. And then I've got, of course, their employee identification numbers. This is the last four digits of their social security number. And I've put in their wages. Notice when I did my organization on my Excel spreadsheet, I'm able to verify that I'm inputting the right information, okay? Then I'm inputting my FTE counts. And then, this is the scary part, if I don't pay my people what they should be paid based on this whole forgiveness conversation, right? And that ties back to making sure that my wages were within 25% of the pre-disaster wages. Okay, you remember that from that PPP conversation early on. Well, the way they're actually calculating that in the application is what tells you what kind of penalties you're going to incur, all right? And so it's a really significant uh, deal. So in my scenario, I didn't pay somebody $200 uh, what I should have paid them. So for $200 spread over eight weeks, right, that's, a, that's an oversight. It ends up costing me $16,000. So when I tell you, do this now, understand, because if you're cognizant of what those penalties are going to look like, you're, it's much easier to correct small errors like that that aren't going to leave you sitting there with a large penalty. So start doing the math now because it'll make your uh, conversation much easier uh, later down the road, right before you have to turn in your forgiveness paperwork. <clears throat> but the, the application is actually fairly simple in that respect. That's probably the hardest part. Later, you start going over any type of penalties for the FTEs. So again, you're looking at those uh, reference period versus covered period in between to figure out whether or not you can find safe harbor. All right, hang on. Let's see, I'm trying to, see, I'm trying to uh, maneuver here. Here we go. <clears throat> so that's, this, that's the uh, worksheet first part. The second part of the worksheet goes into understanding the penalties for the, um, hang on. there we go. Yeah. It, was, it goes into understanding the salary penalties. So again, we're back to the application where you would, uh, I'm gonna try to zoom in here for you guys, where you would take the information from the worksheets that you ran, right? and you would input them directly in these line items. Now that is really clear guidance. There's not a lot of uh, difficulty in there, but one thing that I wanted to point out for my sole proprietors or independent contractors is the things like uh, table 
one and table two that you saw where you had to input your employees, that will remain blank for you. Where you really focus on is just the application here, this first page. You really don't have to worry so much with the rest of it. You're very lucky in that respect. You're just gonna come down and it's gonna talk about your ownership wages, all right? And so you're gonna input your owner manager wages right here in this in this uh, front part of the application. And then at that in that respect, um, for those sole proprietors or independent contractors, you can only claim uh, eight weeks worth of pay. All right, that was made very clear through this past weekend's release of the interim guidelines. So how you do that is when you applied for your PPP loan, you typically used your Schedule C from 2019. It was line 31, which was equal to your net income. You uh, divided that by 12 to get an average monthly payroll figure, right? And you multiply that by 2.5. That's how you kind of figured your PPP. Going into the forgiveness conversation, you're going to use that same line 31 from 2019, but you're going to divide it by 52. Okay, so that gives you to a weekly number. And then you're going to multiply that by eight. And that's what you claim is your payroll. That's the most you can claim is your payroll. The difference, that other 25% of your total PPP has to be claimed in things like um, your mortgage interest, your rent, lease, or utility bills, and you have to document those the same as everybody else. Now, I still do recommend that you take like a, a separate account, separate bank account for those PPP funds. You're going to treat it just like you were a larger business, and you're going to pay yourself a payroll check right? Because we know that SBA is always looking for a two source verification of use of funds. Still do that, but for you, this application gets a whole lot easier because you're really not having to focus so much on those other schedules. It just goes right into uh, identifying the details of your loan, what your covered period was, and how much you paid yourself, and then documenting those other non-payroll expenses. But in the end, as you can see in this example, because I uh, didn't pay somebody $200 more, right, it was just an oversight in this respect, ended up costing me over $12,000 in uh, forgiveness funds. So the most I got forgiven for my $22,000 figure was $10,242. And that was not because of my FTE count. Now, just know FTE count is huge. That's where you get the most penalties. This was really a result of me not paying attention to how much I was paying my employees and then just barely cutting somebody too close. So um, that is why that call to action that I mentioned earlier on in the presentation is so owners don't get this right. All right, let's look at that because I actually did a calculation on the uh, what was left over if I had to do a loan for the remaining funds, uh, which was $12,507.78 unforgiven, that 1% over two years means that I'm paying $530 a month for the next two years, starting October 29th, right? But still, just because I didn't pay somebody $200 over an eight week time frame. That's how crazy this is. So it's really important that we are diligent about really monitoring our use of funds and making sure that we're adhering to those penalty guidelines and taking advantage of those safe harbors. Thanks, Rebecca. Wow. I mean, so those of you who are trying to find, uh, to the attendees, trying to find the ultimate calculator online, you know, to help you with all this, I would probably, and Rebecca, you know, uh, hopefully I, I'm correct, I would probably start working on the application and through the schedules to get those final numbers. Correct, because those calculators aren't going to do you any help if you don't understand your reference period that's best for you, you don't understand your covered period expenses. So all that detail work needs to be done even before you can get to a calculator. Yeah, no, those, those are those are all very, very great points. And Rebecca, it's already 10.53 right now, and so I know you you have to cut out because you're, you're being, uh, you're going to be on another uh, another presentation here shortly, but so we appreciate your time. Do you have you have time maybe just for like one question? Oh sure, I'd love to. Okay, great. Deidre, what do we have? And here's uh, here's Rebecca's contact information for for those uh, for the attendees. We have so many. We have so many great questions. 
Um, and also uh, many thanks for great information uh, that's been provided. So um, I think one particular one question in particular um, that came up had to do with having included independent contractors in the original application and been funded because they were the earliest applicants uh, that included those subcontractors. What is the best step at this time if those uh, had been included and, uh, and have been paid since that time? All right. Well, you know, that's a really good conversation because they're not alone. Um, again, this information is changing so rapidly that we, we can only be held accountable for what we know at that time. Right. So in that respect, I would tell them, don't worry. Just make sure that as you fill out the forms for forgiveness, that you're really open and you document when you received it, what was the knowledge at that time, and that you're upfront with not knowing. Okay, I would still say utilize the funds in the manner that they were intended, meaning that if you, when you took the PPP funds, intended on treating those individuals as part of a, a labor pool, that as you're using those funds, you're matching that. Okay, it's, it's the what comes in is what you're using going out. You're just going to document that. Um, I would have an open conversation and document it in writing with the PPP lender stating that this is where you are and this is what you're doing. If they themselves see any corrections that they would recommend to you, that you adhere to those. But in that case, um, just make sure that you are documenting your decision process, when those decisions were made, and don't feel bad if you want to give back some of those PPP funds. Now, earlier, they had told us that we had up until um, May 14th for a safe harbor. But just know that in integrity for handling these PPP funds correctly, you still can, uh, if you recognize that you gained benefit of more funds than what you should have received, you can still pay those back to your PPP loan fund. There's no penalties. There's no interest issues there. You just pay it back, and it just shows in good faith that you are trying to correct any errors on your judgment or part, and that you're um, you're seeing that as a, a way of protecting from overborrowing, right? So just know you can always prepay, but at the end of the day, you do not want to use any of these government funds for any non-approved expenses. I know that there's some people out there uh, making presentations saying is after June 30th, go ahead and use it for whatever. I'm telling you no, um, and that is based off of my knowledge of SBA for over a decade. You cannot use those funds for anything other than what they were told or that you said you were going to use them for. If you do, that goes against the contracts that you signed as well as the um, the statement that you made. You, you can find yourself in big trouble if you do that. So make sure that if you said you're going to use them in payroll, you use them in payroll and you're doing the best you can from an integrity standpoint. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank you. I know you have to get going and we very much appreciate your time and uh, your, your knowledge and experience that you provided the attendees today. So we know you have to, to sign off, uh, you know, have a great rest of your day. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. And we hope to have you back again. Okay. Thank you guys. Take yeah. care. Good luck. Thank you. And uh, so to the rest of the attendees, uh, you know, as I mentioned at the very beginning of our uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, of, this, of this particular event that we are, we are probably not going to be able to get to each and every one of your questions, but here's our contact information again, where if you visit our website, you'll be able to get a, gain a great deal of information and resources uh, for the funding and, you know, bringing your employees back to a safe workplace, cybersecurity. Uh, but if, uh, Deidre, if there's additional questions, I'd like to invite in our our guest advisor, Mr. Rex Steele, we're willing to go beyond uh, 11 o'clock just to make sure that we answer as many questions as we possibly can uh, So uh, to get rested. So uh, Deidre, is there anything else? Hi, Rex, how are you doing? Yeah, thank you. Great, so um, the some of the, some of the questions we're getting now have to do uh, with um, whether or not you can extend all funds on payroll expenses and rather than um, including the 
um, the non-payroll expenses that are allowable and still expect 100% forgiveness. From what I understand is I've, I've had several businesses ask that same question as before, uh, but as you just described is you can't overpay what your normal average income was supposed to be for the previous time period during this time period as well. Uh, <clears throat> all the money must be spent before the end of the eight weeks is up. Uh, from what I understand, uh, and then uh, make sure you do not go over the 25% from uh, other sources like uh, utilities or rent or interest on the mortgage, things of that nature. Uh, but from what I understand is that you uh, can spend all of it on your uh, uh, salary stuff as long as it meets what your normal salaries were beforehand. If it doesn't, then you might want to look into the other 25%. Uh, to pay off on some of those other bills. So do you have any um, best practice recommendations for those sole proprietors um, who maybe are, are not clear on how to, uh, uh, Rebecca shared with us, you know, a best practice on ensuring that we keep our um, payments separate from our business and personal accounts, but what are some of those other best practices for sole proprietors in terms of paying themselves uh, if their income was variable in the past year as they applied? Yeah, based on what they originally signed up for is what their income was. That's the max that they'll be able to take out during that eight week period. Uh, they can take that out either in portions or all at one time. I'm recommending to all the businesses that I work with that they show documentation and proof of where that money came from as far as the PPP funds separate from their other accounts and stuff to show a, a, a critical track line of where the money's come from and where is it going and when, and to be able to show proof of that as well. You do not want to commingle that money with your personal money. Uh, that's a big no-no, and you get in serious trouble for that. So the biggest thing that I'm advising is make sure you have a good track record of accountability. So uh, check stubs that was written, out for your payroll uh, as an independent contractor yourself uh, and, and make sure you can distinguish what that money came from, what it's used for compared to the rest of your expenses on your business. Uh, we're dealing with a federal government loan here and you do not want to mess around with the government on this or the IRS. Great. I think some of the other questions are pretty specific and we will certainly be following up with um, everyone, Rex, I know you've been doing this a long time. Any other best practice you want to share, things that have really helped your, your clients during this time? Uh, this, like, like Rebecca had indicated, this is probably a little more complicated than what people were expecting. Uh, initially, they came out claiming, hey, we're going to give you guys free money, go for it. But historically, the SBA or, or Treasury Department or IRS, they all want documentation for proof. And I, historically, I've been through some situations with disaster loans and stuff that people got uh, got bitten on because they did not document their stuff correctly. It's critically important that you have paper trails, uh, that you use the money like you're supposed to use it, uh, because you, if you do get audited, there's a lot of severe penalty uh, that can come from that, um, including I've seen in cases of the jail time as well. Uh, I'm not saying that this would take place here on this particular disaster loan, but I have seen it in previous disaster loans as well. So stick to the guidelines, and if you need some assistance, uh, work with your local SPDC organization that can work with you on help put this together. Between you and them and the banks, uh, we ought to be able to make this work to get you to max out of this. Key point here is that we're trying to maximize the relief part of it, so you don't have to pay back the loan. Any amount you have to pay back, is something that you was not planning on initially. So you wanna make sure that everything is correct at the maximum. But also one thing that I'm not sure if it was proclaimed, any uh, cash advance money that you might have received on EIDL has to be logged in on your application as well. I talked to the bank this morning just to confirm what I was thinking, that for instance, like if you receive $10,000 from a cash advance, but you would have to deduct that $10,000 from the money that you got from the PPP uh, one way or another, either give that extra $10,000 back to the PPP bank 
or accept it into the loan, 1% loan that's part of the deal as well. Great. Well, I thank you so much for being here today. And Jaime, I think uh, we'll follow up with um, the, some of the other great questions that we've had, and we'll certainly be keeping everyone apprised of uh, future trainings as well. Great, good deal. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Rhett, Mr. Rex to, uh, for attending, helping us. Uh, and so to the audience, thank you for sticking here a few minutes after. We want to make sure we went over a few questions and, and posed a few points uh, you know, to you all. So this will be recorded and uploaded to our website here today. So please visit our website as you can see the address there on your screen. Uh, if we did not get to your questions or you wanted to wait to pose another question to us uh, and get continued technical business assistance that we'd be more than happy to uh, to provide you. You may email us or contact us directly. So again, our next COVID business town hall will be uh, on June 9th, and uh, we will make sure and send you the, uh, the registration link and the contact information there. Again, thank you all for attending. We, we did our best to, be able to bring you the most updated information that we have received from the Small Business Administration and the Treasury Department in regards to the Paycheck Protection Program Loan Forgiveness. Uh, we hope that you all obtained, uh, uh, to the business owners, uh, to the very, very small businesses, to the small to medium-sized businesses, please, please reach out to us, to our financial institution friends. We're trying to make your, uh, the process a lot uh, more feasible, a lot easier for you all when your clients do come up for loan forgiveness. So please reach out to us if we can be assistance. And again, thank you to everyone. You'll have a, a great week and uh, look out for additional, as the mentioned, additional trainings and webinars. Thank you.